So this is the demo for the timed assessment. Um, I guess I'll just get started. I'm going to do the multiple choice at least once and the free form timed assessment, I, I guess, exactly once. And um, for fun, uh, let me do something that that I uh, advise you not to do. <laughs> um, meaning, uh, so, you know, if you do what I'm going to do now, that is actually considered cheating. So please don't do that. I am going to use ChatGPT to see how well it does uh, with the multiple choice questions. When I, um, when I tried out a few while I was writing the programming questions into the system, ChatGPT was actually doing pretty well. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets 70% uh, or higher. And from last time <laughs> of me trying, we know that uh, 10 minutes is actually enough amount of time for me to copy and paste uh, questions into ChatGPT, get a response and post. <laughs> and we will see if how good the uh, May 12th, well, today, May 12th version of ChatGPT is in answering these questions. Um, and any questions you get wrong, I will go back and explain. Um, so, um, again, warning, caveat for those, <laughs> for the, this, uh, I'm doing this as an instructor, as a demo. If a student does what I'm doing, that is cheating, please don't do it. I, I, I am serious. Sorry, I have to smile, but I am serious. Oh. All right, so we'll get started here. We got 10 minutes and not a lot of time. Uh, yeah, ChatGPT is going to get this question right. It's uh, the kind of thing I've never seen it miss, actually. To give it some reference that it can refer to. And, uh, I wish uh, when it recognizes a question as being like a test or question, it would refuse to answer, but I also don't see that being uh, in the profit incentive of open AI people. So I, you know, it's one of those unreasonable wishes that I have. Yeah, that's correct, actually. Yeah. So ChatGPT tends to miss uh, calculation questions. And I think uh, my memory programming this in, uh, a lot of these are mostly description questions, so um, I think a ChatGPT is going to do really well. Again, that's not a, um, my <laughs> advice remains. Um, please don't use ChatGPT while you're doing it. I mean, if it helps you learn, you can do that. You know, first to do your attempt and use ChatGPT to figure out what you missed and um, try to learn from it. That, you know, no problem, totally allowed. But while you are taking it, for the 10 minutes while you have access to this during your, one of your three attempts, you should not be getting any outside help. And that includes ChatGPT. And um, what I need to take into account for the future is, um, so, you know, that 10 minute limit was set really with the thinking that it's the kind of thing that um, check can't do because um, because the people who answer on check, there's just not enough time within the 10 minutes for someone on check to actually be able to get the questions and do it. But um, AI tool like ChatGPT, that's not really a, an actual restriction. So for the future, I'll have to think about how to, uh, you know, make sure people aren't gaining unfair advantage through a tool like ChatGPT. And I guess uh, I mean unfair really only in the sense that, um, you know, people who are honest should have advantage, not disadvantage. But if uh, you can get better score with the ChatGPT than people can get through honest attempt, then I do think I have to set up some system where people don't feel like they are cheated out of better grade through putting in honest effort. So, but, um, well, yeah, <laughs> that's for future semesters for something for me to think through. And uh, I guess I'm saying those things while typing this mainly to show how good I am at multitasking. Um, it's a different part of the brain, I think. Um, the kind of the pathways that go from, um, that go from my eye to typing, 
that doesn't necessarily involve the language processing uh, rules. I, I can't tell if that's right or not because uh, I need to actually stop. <laughs> I need to start stop talking about other not relevant things in order to, to think this through. Um, so. Yeah, well, again, I wouldn't be surprised if ChatGPT does 70% or better on this set because so many of the questions are qualitative, the kind of questions that ChatGPT does well in. And not to continue <laughs> repeating myself, <laughs> it's totally not an endorsement. I have to say again for emphasis that use of ChatGPT during a timed assessment is uh, is cheating and um, and 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 there may be severe consequences uh, and it really comes down to at some point in your academic and professional career what really matters is what you know and uh, I guess uh, or put it this way if uh, what you are able to do can be done by an automated automated tool like ChatGPT then whatever job you get that can be automated by a tool like a ChatGPT, that's going to be gone in the future because whatever can be automated won't, um, it, you know, people won't be willing to pay other human beings for that to get done. So um, your long term um, career plan is in things that really can't be automated. And I do believe a genuine engineering problem is solving those that still, I, I don't think uh, we are anywhere near where that can be automated. So, oh, oh yeah, 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 that's right. Um, I don't know if that's right, but choice and all that is consistent. Uh, so, 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 you know, uh, learning this uh, lower division content now ensures that you are ready to learn um, the upper division content, which is uh, part of, um, oh wait, Copy the wrong part, which is part of the, um, the training for a job of the an engineer whose main task I still believe can't be automated easily with the ChatGPT, uh, or at a minimum you need someone to validate uh, that the answer that automated tool gives is correct because uh, you've heard about ChatGPT hallucinating that and all this stuff. Uh, an actual intelligence has to check if a uh, automated tool has uh, gone astray, hallucinating things. Um, I don't know if we will understand that hat notation, but that's uh, how I would type it to um, get that thing. Okay, so that's uh, all the 10 questions. Um, got three minutes. Oh, maybe I can tell. Let me see which questions that I think is correct or incorrect. And then whenever I run out of time, I run out of time. That's correct. That's correct. Um, uh, that's uh, incorrect. Yeah, so that's correct answer. Um, Correctly. Now that sounds correct. Well, De Broglie wavelength of a proton. Oh, it feels like it should be. Sh or that sounds. That seems reasonable. It's either this or that. So maybe this. We'll see. Um, that's correct. That's correct. Is it gonna get hundred percent? Oh, uh, this is not incorrect. Uh, yeah, this is incorrect. So it, question eight is going to be wrong. Um, it's in second low energy level. And how many locations? Uh, second low, there's only one. So this is going to be wrong, two wrong so far. Um, 
but not to the this applies to both so what doesn't apply is the smoothness so <laughs> so church bit is gonna get 70 percent right I think um, oh yeah let me submit that end um, 70 percent or 60 percent yeah 70 percent well wow. yeah yeah and it's uh, really having mostly to do with the uh, um, with the type of question. Uh, uh, in this set, most of it is descriptive, recalling definitions. That's the kind of uh, questions that ChatGPT does really well in. So, um, so I already determined which ones it got right and correct. So this, it got correct. Yeah, that's the correct answer. Uh, and if you want, ask a follow-up question for explanation here. Yeah, that's correct. And yeah. After all, and the thermal equilibrium, that's really the uh, argument to use to also say that it's the ideal emitter at a given temperature, it emits more than non black bodies would. Um, um, yeah. So, following statements, yeah, so we yeah, are incorrectly, uh, A, yeah, that's. Uh, because the photons do not carry electric charge. Yeah, that's incorrect, and the rest are correct. Um, and here, yeah. So C is correct, and I think it did it. Yeah, it explained that why the other ones are not in, not correct, incorrect. Um, and uh, the <clears throat> let's see. So yeah, that's the formula to use, and be right. Those are the numbers to use, and yeah, I I think yeah that seems right. Um, well, this I don't have memorized, but um, yeah, yeah. So six, uh, yeah, joule is not. So all other units have uh, uh, commonality. It's energy times time. That's the correct unit for Planck scale or energy divided by frequency. Um, so for this question, yeah, well defined energy. I'm yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think this is meant to be uh, what I would consider to be the trick choice, and uh, I don't think a ChatGPT gets tricked by something like that because uh, this is really um, me hoping for uh, some sort of free association between stationary and zero velocity. And I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that actually tricks a student. <laughs> but, uh, so here, okay, I think ChatGPT got this wrong. Let's see where it uh, missed. So, uh, so the correct uh, answer would have been this. And ChatGPT said, with a very precise, yeah, could have any moment, it is very uncertain. And correspond, yeah, large uncertain momentum. Uh, yeah, and then this sentence it just got confused. Therefore, the momentum of the particle is not uncertain. No, you just said it larger the uncertainty, so it is uncertain. Um, yeah, so the reason this is the incorrect answer is uh, it's explained in the the simulation lab that you did. Um, so this uh, co corresponds to what we call collapse of wave function in uh, Copenhagen interpretation. So if you had a kind of broadly distributed wave function, when you make a position measurement, and let's say you find a particle here, then the, this broader wave function, it collapses into a sharply picked function here. So when you immediately remeasure the position of the particle, it'll be found somewhere near this newly sharply picked wave function. So. Um, so like this is an incorrect understanding slash description of uncertainty principle. Otherwise, you know, if it didn't happen this way, it seem, um, measurement wouldn't really have sense because after you've measured the particle here, when you immediately remeasure if your particle have somewhere else, it looks like it's just jumping around. So does it, did you even measure it to be at a position? Like you need to be able to make consistent measurement um, if there's no time in which the particle to move around. Uh, multiple measurements of the ident multiple measurement of the same particle at the same time should uh, yield consistent values. So, 
question nine. Uh, suppose that energy. Uh, you don't need to go into energy level. You, you need to go into the shapes. Yeah, which is this. We, we need to find the point where it's zero. I mean, not not for this reason. It's because the question told you to <laughs> avoid this. Um, yeah, so I think it just, uh, um, I guess it's the kind of the visual reasoning that, uh, you know, a language model can't do. So uh, for me, this is how I, I would answer this question. You know, it's a visual reasoning thing. You can almost imagine quickly sketching out what the solutions look like. So if I have this infinite square well, it's going to have some ground state energy where a particle looks like this. This is the well, snapshot over time, it uh, goes to this. And this is the next energy level. There's gonna be one more node in between. And that's actually the pattern. Um, with each new uh, higher energy level, you get an additional node. So it looks like this. And so, so each of these nodes are the locations where um, you have zero probability of detecting the particle. So since the question said uh, particle is in its uh, second lowest uh, allowed energy level, so you have one location where the um, there's a zero probability of detecting the particle. Um, and I believe I randomized this. So this is second, it could be you know, it could be third, um, so this would be for third, this would be for fourth, then there's a pattern here, you know, this is for fifth, and this is for sixth. Yeah, yeah, so that's the correct answer. Finally, um, yeah, this one, I wonder what explanation ChatGPT gave. Um, oh, wait, did I misunderstand what it said? Uh, no, 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 I didn't misunderstand. So apply to final square well, but not to infinite square well. So continue the wave function applies to both the finite and infinite. Yeah, it does. That's correct. But the question is asking for one and not the other. Um, but, you know, so this description of D is actually correct. <laughs> I don't know why it got wrong. So uh, uh, I guess it's because it didn't recognize that this is wrong. So smoothness, meaning the derivative on one side is equal to the other. Um, the times when they can be broken is when the change in the potential is infinite, uh, as you have in the infinite square well. With the finite square well, this will um, it'll be smooth. The derivative on one side and the other will be the same. So for infinite square well, no, it's not smooth. It's uh, continuous. It doesn't suddenly jump, but the slope of it jumps. So it didn't know that. So um, no, th this is. Uh, I mean, I think this is meant to be kind of a silly thing. Uh, like this is not a boundary condition at all. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's not a boundary condition at all. Uh, although, uh, I don't know. So, uh, as a matter of equation, I think this might be could be made to hold, but it's not a boundary condition. Um, and uh, I, I guess if it, um, yeah, the thing that makes me hesitate is so if you are thinking of the energy operator. What that would look like is, you know, momentum squared over 2m plus the, the potential energy operator. So in the differential equation terms, it looks like minus h bar double um, position derivative divided by 2m um, plus the potential as a functional position. And uh, what I was thinking through was, well, with the infinite square well on the left-hand side, so, you know, on the side where this goes up to infinity, um, but I think uh, what you get is the wave function suddenly goes 
flat to zero. So, um, well, yeah, I guess it's still right. So the way I think it works out is actually this. Um, so for e times of psi, this has to multiply to psi, and psi it does go to zero. Yeah, I don't think it holds for infinite square well. So if you imagine like this being the left side, this being right. So on the right side, where potential is equal to zero, this whole expression, it won't be zero. You'll have some um, non-zero thing. But on the left-hand side, by virtue of psi going to zero, because otherwise you get nonsense with this potential. Uh, on the left-hand side, this uh, is equal to zero. So, so this uh, expression, I believe it would hold with a finite square well. But with the infinite square well, it won't, because on one side it, it's forced down to zero, on the other side it's not. So that's incorrect. Um, and yeah, this is not a thing. Um, so just doesn't yeah. so so yeah those were all the questions well the 10 that i got there's more in the question pool give it a try and i guess after you've tried if uh, somehow ChatGPT helps you learn then great i have no problem with that if we are using ChatGPT while you are taking the multiple choice time, time assessment that again is cheating please don't do that okay so for the Freeform timed assessment. Um, yeah, I still need to program in the model answers. I'll do it soon. Um, so here I'll just uh, go through it. I haven't actually looked at the questions at all. I do know it's going to be you know one of the five or six questions that I recently programmed in. So I still have the advantage of somewhat remembering the questions. We'll see how well I can do the solutions. Uh, let me bring up one tool in case I need to use it, uh, SageMath. So I'm just launching that in the background. And... All right, so we are at 4.27, so we got 20 minutes. Let me get started. So it says, one of the significant accomplishments of quantum mechanics in developing a uh, Bohr model. OK. Yeah, I'm going to use Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> so, it really saves time in having to look up constants and all that sort of stuff. Um, OK. So it says, yeah, before we start, yeah, yeah. let's do a simple estimate. Heizmann principally says that, right? Meaning the yeah on the known size of so let me just briefly jot down my derivation for the equation that I'll be using. So for a we are starting out with you know this, and for many of these uncertainty principle calculation, we are really going to keep just the equality portion. Uh, inequality means you know it can be greater, or if you have a flipped around it can be less. And in terms of determining where the threshold is. That's always going to be determined by the equality portion of it. So I'll be treating this almost as if it's a equality. But just remember it's not, so um, don't be surprised if they aren't equal to each other. So they give us the delta x, and it says estimate a minimum value for the magnitude of momentum of the electron. Yeah. So I'm going to solve this for delta p for equality. So delta p is equal to? h bar over 2 times the delta x. That feels right. Um, so this is a sort of how I imagine. If I have a distribution of momentum, then if I have um, this amount of uncertainty in it, then you know, imagine I'm trying to get my magnitude of momentum as small as possible. So I pick the average where the um, average will be 0. But it'll still have some spread like this. And this spread should be associated in some way with the delta p. So that's going to be related to magnitude of momentum. That's consistent with uncertainty principle. So, um, so delta p is, uh, or uh, p mean is equal to delta p mean 
is equal to h bar over 2 times delta x, which doing the calculation you know from alpha is uh, h bar divided by 2 times um, 1 e minus 10 meters. Yeah, and I think it will understand h bar as being reduced to the Planck constant. Yeah. So we have. Um, yeah, so momentum, I guess it's uh, kind of hard to say. Um, yeah, convenient. I, I think the most convenient unit is this. It's the basic SI unit. So 5.273 E minus 15 uh, kilogram times meter per second. And uh, I, I don't know if you can make a sense of that. Um, it, for most of us, we don't really have number sense for numbers that small. Um, since the Bohr model is built on key assumption, that angular momentum yeah, takes this form, find the minimum radius of it that is clear. Yeah. Okay. So let me go through that derivation. So we are starting out with this statement that the angular momentum is quantized. And if you are thinking of like a circular orbit, um, the orbital angular momentum, it can be zero. So really the value of n needs to start from one and so on. And I guess uh, the first thing is it's a question of, okay, so at the minimum orbital radius, is your angular momentum smallest or largest? Let me go with a bold assumption that um, at the minimum radius, my angular momentum that's consistent with all other things it's going to be the smallest. In that case, it'll be just h bar or 1 h bar. So this uh, restriction can be connected to other mechanical expressions. Like, so, you know, angular momentum, you could write it as rotational inertia times angular velocity, or you could write that as the displacement cross product with the P, where P is mv. So, you know, uh, n times r cross b, and that feels more um, uh, sensible just because I think it will more directly connect to um, sort of orbital motion as opposed to this, which might not. So, um, so yeah, let me start by just writing this out. My angular momentum is that and if I have the situation where this is the atomic nucleus, here's my electron that's going around in orbit. And if it's going in the direction I marked, if it's going in this direction, then the displacement R, it's a perpendicular to velocity. So I can kind of simplify it for the magnitude of this thing, which is simply going to be, uh, so m r b sine theta, where sine theta is one because theta is 90 degrees. So my angular momentum is m times r times v. And we are saying, according to Bohr's bold assumption, that this is going to equal to h bar. All right, let's see here. Um, so we have this, m r v is equal to h bar. And I hope you recognize that we have two unknowns, radius and velocity. So we need one more equation to kind of make uh, sense of this. And that equation, um, Um, I believe will come from conservation of energy. So, cons um, or the conservation of energy? Well, um, the, the energy of uh, electron It's going to be potential energy plus kinetic energy, which will be um, minus 
Oh, and it says it used this. So uh, the Coulomb constant, which can be written as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the amount of charge uh, at the center of the atomic nucleus, that's E, uh, divided by R, distance. That's uh, the expression for uh, grab, uh, the electrostatic potential energy when it's been said so that at infinity that's zero. And uh, that's the expression for potential energy, that plus one half mv squared is equal to, what are they together equal to? Um, hmm. I'm getting a little stuck here, sorry. Well, I think I can do this. Um, hmm. Well, let's say this is, is equal to some total energy. then I could eliminate V here. I could say um, I could say V is equal to H bar over MR and when I plug it in there will be an expression for R. Mm. Let me take one shortcut. I happen to know um, what this uh, needs to equal to. And sorry, I can't justify this well right now other than to appeal to something called the Virial Theorem. Um, I happen to know that this has to, this uh, sum has to be um, half of this uh, quantity. So it needs to be minus 1 eighth pi epsilon naught times E over R. I happen to know that. Then um, in this expression, now uh, I have two equations and two unknowns, R and V. So I can eliminate V and solve for R. Let me do that. Um, so plugging in expression for V, I have 1 half M h bar squared over m squared r squared. Um, and uh, imagining taking this expression and just uh, multiplying through by r squared, this is what I'm going to have. Minus e over 4 pi epsilon naught r plus 1 half h bar squared over m is equal to minus e over a pi epsilon naught r, collect like terms, um, then, well, moving this over here, I so it's like plus e over 4 pi epsilon naught r, and combining these two, I know that, uh, that so, you know, this is 2 eighth, so, this gets canceled out, this gets one. So it this becomes E R over eight pi epsilon naught. Now I can solve this for R. Solving this for R, we get R is equal to or move all of this over um, four pi epsilon naught h bar squared over M. Let's plug in the numbers and see. So r is equal to 4 times pi times epsilon naught times h bar squared over m times e. If I, when I plug this into Wolfram Alpha, I have a kind of a natural test for if I made any mistakes. Because if I didn't, then this will come out in the correct unit of basic SI unit. If it doesn't, then I know I might have made some mistakes. So electron mass times elementary charge. Yep. 
मेरे सिखाए Yeah, I made. Oh, oh, I see. I had a missing fact. So this is that's the electric potential. I need to multiply that by uh, element. So I I need uh, this thing squared for energy. So wherever I see, I need to make sure that it's squared. So let me make that correction. Electro elementary charge squared. Yeah, that seems right. Um, so elementary charge squared, that's equal to 5.29 times 10 to the power of minus 11 meter. Yeah, I think that resembles the value I remember. And uh, after the time runs out, let me see if I can justify <laughs> what I did here. Um, so for now, I'm uh, appealing to my knowledge of something called the Virial Theorem. But I realize that's not the best justification, so let me come back to it in a bit. Uh, it asks, asks, what is the kinetic energy of the electron in the orbit you calculated in B? So um, that is actually a lot easier um, if I say this. So I happen to know, um, through knowing this, 1 half mv squared is going to equal uh, this thing positive, 1 8th pi epsilon naught e squared over r. So let me calculate this. This I can calculate without having to calculate v first. So, uh, so let me do that. So I have um, 1 over 8 pi epsilon naught. Um, oh, uh, let me do it this way. Oh. So, for in place of R, let me just put this whole thing. So, 1 pi epsilon naught. And where there is R would be, I'll say this thing. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so times uh, elementary charge squared. And if I didn't make any algebra mistakes, this will give me an answer in unit of energy. Good. So the kinetic energy here will be yeah, thirteen point six zero six one eb. Yeah. So the kinetic energy here, in terms of expression, that's gonna be one over eight pi epsilon naught times um, elementary charge or sorry e squared divided by r, uh, where r is the orbital radius calculated above. Uh, this kinetic energy is equal to uh, plus 13.61 eb. Um, and that makes sense because the potential energy will be twice minus this. So when you add them together, you get minus 13.6 eb that you might remember from uh, Bohr energy levels. Uh, what is the magnitude of the momentum of the electron in this orbit? Okay. Yeah, I should have just calculated the V. Okay, so let's do this. Um, I need an expression for MV. So, so what I can do is I can actually rewrite this left-hand side as P squared over 2N. Then I can rewrite this to this. Um, solve this for P, momentum. Then what I have is P is a square root of 2N times all of this. Um, e squared over 8 pi epsilon naught r. So um, let's put it this way. P is equal to square root of 2 times m times kinetic energy, um, where kinetic energy is the kinetic energy calculated above. And I need to plug in the numbers. So this is the kinetic energy calculated above. 
2 times electron mass times that. Okay, square root of all that. And again, if I didn't make any mistakes, it will correctly give me something in unit of kilogram, yeah, meter per second. So um, P is equal to 1.993 times 10 to the power of minus 24 kilogram times meter per second. Yeah. Um, okay, how much time do I have? Two minutes. So, um, yeah, justifying that leap that I made um, of simply using the real theorem. Um, how can I do that without... So I think what I need to use um, for this part, um, so let me do this, do it this way. Uh, yeah, I remember. So this is how I should have done it. Uh, so instead of using justifying um, the real theorem, I kind of misremember the step. So really to um, make the connection of some of the mechanical parameters and the orbital size r, instead of jumping to this consideration of energy, what I should have jumped to is centripetal force. So centripetal force says this, that if I have a particle moving at some speed v, then the centripetal force expression mv squared o is given by mv squared over r. This is the you know, mass times the centripetal acceleration. And in the case of hydrogen atom, this centripetal force is given by the electrostatic force, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the product of charges divided by r squared. Yeah, that's what I should have done. So, so this is one equation involving um, involving R and V, one. And I had that other equation involving R and V, and V R, the angular momentum is equal to H bar, two. So, uh, so we can, uh, we can, in these two equations, now we can eliminate, uh, eliminate V. And uh, we should still get the same expression because I, these mechanical relationships are kind of, um, they duplicate each other. So let me do it this way. Solving this for V, which I've done before, H bar over MR. When I plug that in there, what I get for the left-hand side is M times H bar squared over M squared R squared divided by R. That's equal to the right-hand side, E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. Let me cancel out the things that cancel. Um, then solving for R, the sole factor of R here, then you end up with R is equal to 4 pi epsilon naught H bar squared over M E squared. Uh, which is what I derived up above using different set of expressions and more advanced thing than what's necessary for this. Yeah, yeah. So this is how I would recommend that you do it. So, uh, so let me do it this way. For the attached work, where you know I have time to organize, I don't necessarily have to do the same thing that I did when I was um, under stress. So I guess uh, what I would do is okay. I don't really need to appeal to the energy of the electron, so um, at least not for part A. So I'll start with the, or not for part B. Let me paste in part A. And for part B, we have um, this piece. And then I'll have to uh, select the right part. Um, So, uh, so th this part is uh, duplicated. So let me not 
הבדל, אוקיי? Um, uh, well, the numbering for the equation is a little bit off. So let me just number this as 2, since the other equation already was already numbered as 1. Okay, yeah, 1 and 2, and combining them, you get that. And uh, I have C and D. And, uh, you know, uh, as my usual advice, you know, you should uh, do more organizing than what I'm doing right now, which is very minimal. It's all right. I think that's everything. Oh, what's wrong? I think there's some nested div issue. Let me just get rid of that. see what happens with that. All right. Wait. Did I get rid of one of the images? I think I might have gotten rid of. I have A, B, and then I think I got rid of one of the images that I pasted it. Let's see if I can repaste. Yeah, that's the last one. All right, so that's it. Um, save work and continue. So, um, so yeah, so this is a poor model question. And, um, oh, I guess I did it. Oh, I forgot about that. So let me just look at it. So this answer that I got, comparing it to the answer in A above, they are actually quite uh, similar. So when you look at this, you know, 2 times 10 to the minus 24, that's comparable. It's uh, within a factor of, um, uh, factor of, what is that? Um, uh, factor of 40, <laughs> maybe not then. Okay, let's put it this way. The amount of momentum here that's uh, larger than the minimum momentum uncertainty here. So I would have been in trouble if the magnitude of momentum here was less than the magnitude of the momentum uncertainty here, because it's uh, uh, as it's going in around in circles, the momentum uncertainty would be you know double the magnitude. So um, so the fact that this is larger than what's up here that's consistent with uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The, it, the electron in orbit around the, the nucleus, it doesn't cause the issue with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So, all right, I think that's it. So, um, yeah, the, that's the two attempts, a uh, multiple choice and a free form. Uh, let me, I guess, uh, since I have, what, six minutes, let's do the free form, uh, sorry, multiple choice attempt just one more time. This time without cheating, <laughs> without using um, without using uh, ChatGPT. I think I might still use Wolfram Alpha as my calculator, so I'll have this ready. Well, let me just do this honestly this time, without using any tools that you shouldn't be using. And I'm gonna kind of uh, speed through it um, so that uh, I can do it in six minutes. So, uh, so yeah, there you go. Okay, consider statements regarding follow most correctly. Okay, uh, when they came, you know, yeah, this seems right. Collisions with the light particles, photons. Uh, the rest are, yeah, the wave description. So, yeah, wrong about the atomic line spectrum. Maybe that some uh, describe lines are that. Uh, yes, correct. <laughs> uh, 
frequency of light correspond to energy lost by the electron. Yes, uh, equal to the, yeah, yeah, that's not right. Um, it, um, yeah, it, I guess classically that's what you might have expected, but it's a quantum mechanical phenomenon. So Einstein contribution, photoelectric effect. Um, that's a De Broglie. Um, that's a Planck. That's uh, Rutherford. Yeah, that's uh, Einstein, photoelectric effect. That's a ball. So De Broglie, uh, okay, let's do this calculation. So wavelength is given by uh, the De Broglie relationship, uh, Planck's constant divided by momentum, or mass times velocity. So I'm just going to do this replacement. Planck's constant divided by mass of 2,000 kilogram times velocity, uh, 10 meter per second. So that will give me a super small number, 10 to, yeah. 10 to the minus 38. Uh, Einstein in watershed correctly describes an aspect of no um, photoelectric effect. No. <laughs> Once he starts saying that, I know that's not correct. Uh, for high frequency. This question sounds super similar to this, but. Um, yeah, they're kind of duplicative, but all right. Uh, threshold frequency, yeah, it's important. A lot of photoelectric effect questions here. Um, <coughs> is the minimum frequency of electromagnetic? <coughs> I think that's right. Yeah, no, that's not correct. Maximum possible, yeah. Well, it's a minimum. Uh, higher than that, you exact them with a greater put uh, kinetic energy. Uh, minimum kinetic energy such particle must have. Yeah, so this is an infinite square well question. And um, this is how I remember infinite square well. The kinetic energy of any particle is p squared divided by 2m. Now, this p can be replaced with the de Broglie relationship. Uh, Planck constant divided by wavelength. Now, for square well, the lowest energy, meaning longest wavelength, this uh, wavelength will be twice the length of the well, because uh, the well fits half of the, the wavelength. So with all that, now let's replace the values. Plus constant divided by uh, 0 0.3 times 10 to the minus 24 meters, and the mass of um, 2 GeV per C squared. Yeah, that should be right. If I made any mistake, it'll, you know, give me, yeah, yeah. So MeV 10, yeah, so 11 MeV is the minimum kinetic energy such particle must have. Good. Okay, wave function collapse, yeah, the, correctly describes. <laughs> no, that's not the sense in which it collapses. It collapses horizontally. That's really what the collapse there is. Um, the measures, and it still holds. Uh, the, the momentum uncertainty goes super high. Um, not true. There are an energy eigenstates that have definite energy. So, yeah, yeah. If it, so, this is what you saw in the simulation. If you pause the time, make a two uh, uh, quick succession measurements, they measure more or less the same value. That Because the first time you measured it, it collapsed horizontally. So second time you measure it, it's at the position where you measured it before. Uh, we're used to having a part. It's impossible because uh, a rest will also need to be, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, uh, um, uh, localize the particle as momentum uncertainty, meaning it's not at rest. There's a portion of it that's not at rest. Mm, yeah. Okay, classical model of an atom places electrons in orbit around the atomic nucleus. Uh, measure position one orbit. What happens next? Uh, doesn't come to rest. <laughs> what we talked about above. 
uh, like remains in orbit, but we want uh, within the orbit a fraction. Uh, okay, this is uh, sounds fish to me. Let me just keep reading. The measurement is also nothing funny, but well, no, no, this is the classical description. The electron is knocked out of orbit, and you know, yeah, kind of. So, if you localize the electron in orbit, uh, in that measurement process, so you know, you introduce a ton of momentum uncertainty, and part of that, the way it happens is you know, the collision of the electron with whatever was using to measure it. So, this is probably the most like one. Um, yeah. Okay, so let me make sure I answered everything. And let's see if uh, I do better than ChatGPT. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I, I'm fairly sure I got close to 100%, but let's see. Yeah, <laughs> did better than ChatGPT. And quicker too. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's uh, the multiple choice timed assessment um, and the free form timed assessment. For the free form portion, there are uh, other questions in the set. It's uh, um, so uh, if you are one of the lucky few, as you do this free form assessment, you will get the same question that I got, to which you have uh, hopefully some sense of uh, how to approach it. If you are unlucky and got a different question, then do your best. Um, that's really what I have to say. So with that, uh, thank you so much to those of you joining this uh, virtual class session by recording the video, staying through the end. Again, thank you. Thank you, and uh, I will see you in lab next week.